So, um, so yeah, we'll have two more presentations on Euler, who in my view is probably first or second on the list of, of in terms of prolific mathematicians on the historical continuum. Um, I would like to see Archimedes and Euler go head to head. Uh, I, I think Archimedes, if he would have had the same machinery uh, that Euler had, he probably would have been a lot more impressive than Euler actually. But, but that's hard to say because Euler is the one who invented all that machinery. <laughs> like all of the notation and terminology, it's basically due to Euler. Um, and Euler was, is known to be a very, very nice guy. Uh, was, he was just known, uh, uh, he was loved by all. That is not true of a lot of other mathematicians. So um, that presentation will be next week and then we'll have the, the one on the other, uh, the other chapter concerning Euler, okay? But what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna continue talking about some of this, but I wanted to start with a little uh, refresher on this. Uh, look, I'm, it, it would, I would be totally aghast if you got out of this class and couldn't, and couldn't execute the so-called Euclidean algorithm, okay? This is, this is one of, I think, the most important algorithms. And this is, I'm not joking, okay? I mean, this is one of the most important algorithms in mathematics. Of course, I know there are algorithms like multiplying numbers, right? And, and adding numbers and things like that. But as far as kind of uh, a bedrock for a lot of application across the mathematical spectrum, uh, the Euclidean algorithm is uh, an algorithm par excellence, okay? So uh, remember, I'm gonna leave this up here, this was an example that we did. And in particular, I'm also interested in us finding X and Y, like using this algorithm backwards so that we can find X and Y so that like, you know, the first number times X plus the second number times Y is equal to a given number. And then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna have you work through an example. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how you can actually find all the combinations of those numbers that give two, for instance, okay? I'm gonna show you how you can find all of them, like an exhaustive uh, summary of, of solutions to the combinations of those things that give two. Okay, so it would be an exhaustive, well, or it's Bezos theorem, it's right here. It would be an exhaustive collection of X's and Y's that, uh, that, are, that are integer combinations of the two numbers that give the GCD. Okay, and I'll, I'll sort of show you how to do that. But I'm gonna leave this up here and I want you to work on the following problem though, um, with either on your own or with people around you. Um, I want you to find, okay, so here's a, here's a little warm up exercise. Here's a little warm up exercise. So find the GCD of um, uh, find the GCD of 70, 77 and 35, okay? And find, okay, so that's the first part, and find uh, X and Y such that 77X plus 35y is equal to the GCD of 77 and 35, okay? So I just want you to work on that on your own, okay? Or, or with, with someone next to you as well. That will involve doing something like you see right here on this screen, yeah? Okay, so have at it. Okay, I think you had a far few, fewer steps. Yeah. So uh, hopefully, if you did it right. Okay, so let's, let's kind of check this out. I'm going to uh, let me go like this. Just open up this little whiteboard here and we'll do a little bit of work. Okay. Oh man, that's cool. Right. 
standard. What? Not full screen. What? All right, whatever. I'm leaving it there, okay? Okay, so let's do this. So uh, we want the GCD of 77 and 35. Now, you, you can probably sit here and think, well, I can kind of figure out what that is. Okay, the GCD is the largest number that divides both. You say to yourself, well, 77, that's basically, like here's another way that you can think about this. 77 is, is like seven times 11, correct? And what's 35? Seven times five, and you say to yourself, well, for crying out loud, uh, I have to take as much as I can from each one of these, yes? I, so I have to take the primes that they have in common to build a common divisor. So you can tell right now that the GCD is going to be seven, okay? Well, let, let's just pretend that you didn't know that, okay? So what you would do, so talk me through this, what would you do? So let's use the Euclidean algorithm. So what do you do? Equals 35 times two plus seven. <laughs> yeah. And then what you do is you take the divisor and the remainder, yeah, down to the next line and you get 35 <laughs> is equal to seven times five plus zero. And you go, huh, okay. That means that this guy right here, the, the last non-zero remainder is the GCD. And we even, we even justified that in our minds, yeah? Because we said, every time I swap these out, I'm preserving the GCD every single time, okay? So that, my friends, uh, tells us a combination that will work, it, that gives the GCD. So what is it? 77 times one plus 35 times what? That okay, equals seven. So in other words, this, this right here would be my X, yes? And this right here would be my Y, yeah? Now, here's the question I want to address though together. Are there other, are there any questions on that by, by the way? Any questions? It's fairly straightforward. I mean, that was just like a one step thing. And a lot of times that, that does end up being what happens. It's like, boom, boom. It's not usually as complicated as that 414, 662 example, okay? Are there other uh, X, Y combos that give 77x plus 35y equals seven. The answer is yes, okay? And, and, and deeper than that, and I'm not gonna go into the details here because it, it starts to get a little hazy. There's, there's a class called number theory though, where you would see this thing kind of fleshed out in full detail. Uh, so here's a little fact. A complete solution set uh, for um, AX plus BY equals uh, D, which uh, D is just shorthand notation for the GCD of A and B, so I don't have to keep writing GCD of A and B is given by, is given by X equal to X zero plus B over, or plus T times B over D and Y equal to Y zero minus T times A over D where T can be any integer at all and x0, y0 is one solution. So once I have one solution, I can get them all by kind of using this little formula right here, okay? 
So we have one solution. Let me just write up here. So what, what would be a complete solution set to this thing? A complete solution set. Well, it would be X equal to, can you tell me one solution that we already have? What is it? What, what's a, what's, what's a, what's one X value solution that we have already? One, and what's one Y value solution that we already have? Negative two, okay. And then I, I say plus T times A over D. Now A is the thing that's attached to the X thing, yes? So in this particular case, this is our A and 35 is our B, yes? And of course, seven is our D, yeah? So it's gonna be plus T times B over D. So what is B in this case? All right, so it's gonna be 35 over, what's D? Seven. So what do I have? X equals one plus five T. That's a complete solution set. And for Y, it's negative two minus T times A over D, and A in this case is 77, and I divide that by the greatest common divisor, okay? So that is going to be negative two minus, minus what? 11T, okay? So anything of that form where T is any old integer at all will actually work. So like, so like, for instance, what would be some other solutions? Uh, well, you know, so if I add a multiple of five to one uh, in X and then subtract that same multiple of 11, same, right? T has to be the same for both of these. Subtract that same multiple of 11, I will get another solution, yeah? And, and, and this gives also, all of these are solutions and every solution is accounted for here. It's a complete solution set, okay? So for it, for example, um, X equal to, let's see, uh, one and negative two we already knew about, yes? What if I add five? X equal to six and Y equal to, if I, like one times five is, gives me one, right, one times five, one plus five times one is six. So I'd have to take one times 11 away from negative two. So what would Y have to be? I'm taking t equal to one, right? So it'd be negative 13, right? So this is this is if I take t equal to one, yeah? So that's a solution. What else is a solution? X equal to, I don't know. What if I took t equal to minus one? Well, x equal to negative four and y equal to, if I take t equal to minus one, that's gonna be negative two plus, uh, plus 11, yes? Negative two plus 11, so y would be nine. This is what I get if I take t equal to minus one, right? I mean, you can try that out, but I'm telling you it will work. Uh, 77 times six minus 13 times 35, right? 77 times six minus 13 times 35 will be seven, okay? Similarly, 77 times negative four plus 35 times nine will be seven. Okay, so that's, uh, that's kind of interesting. So that is a complete solution set. And again, in number theory, it's not hard to actually show, but it just kind of gets into the, the divisibility weeds a little bit, okay? Uh, I don't wanna go, go there right now, okay? All right, any, any questions on that? Okay, so the Euclidean algorithm gives a complete solution set to the so-called Bezo equation, okay? Uh, or, yeah, or, or sometimes it's also referred to as the linear Diophantine equation after Diophantus, okay? Um, but let's look at some other things here. Okay, so last time um, you might recall we were looking at these last few things. I just want to make sure that it's clear what is going on here. So the GCD of two numbers is one. 
if and only if there exists a an integer combination of those numbers that gives one, basically, yes? And more generally speaking, we actually said any integer combination of two, of two numbers is always gonna give a multiple of the GCD. Remember that? That's what this little thing said right here. AX plus BY equaling C means that C has to be a multiple of the greatest common divisor, yeah? So the only thing that you can get from combinations of these numbers are multiples of the greatest common divisor, okay? Uh, so GCDAB is one, means that, uh, is equivalent to saying that uh, there exist two integers X and Y such that AX plus BY is one. Secondly, GCD of A and B being one, by the way, another way to say that is relatively prime. Yes, they have no common factors other than one. A divides C and B divides C, since there's no overlap at all between A and B in terms of primes, that means that A times B will also divide C, yes? So if seven divides something and five divides something, then what, the, then what else will divide that same something? Seven times five, yeah? If 11 divides something and two divides something, that same something, then what, what will, what also will divide that same something? 22, two times 11, okay? That's what that second thing is saying. The third thing is saying, suppose I have two things that are relatively prime, A and B. And suppose that A divides B times C. Well, is any of that divisibility coming from B? They don't have anything in common. A and B have nothing in common. So all of that divisibility has to be happening into C. Does that make sense? Okay. A divides B, C, but A and B have nothing in common, then A has to divide C. Okay. So like if seven divides five times something, if seven divides five times something, then seven is really just dividing the something. Does that make sense? It's not, five isn't helping at all. Get it out of there, yeah? Seven divides five times something and seven is just dividing that something, okay? Seven and five aren't, uh, aren't cooperating, yeah? All right, I wanted to talk a little bit about for Fermat's little theorem and talk through what it, what it means, uh, how, and then we'll see how it's useful once we get to the end of cryptography, okay? By the way, uh, the thing that I'm gonna talk about is actually, it's, it's really unique. It's a visual argument for Fermat's little theorem and it's, it, it appears in a very famous number theorist textbook by the name of George Andrews. I've never seen it anywhere else, very clever. It's just purely visu visual, which I think is cool, okay? So here's a picture of Fermat and here's what his theorem says. And by the way, uh, Fermat had this odd habit of not writing down his proofs, okay? Most famously, he did not, he claimed to have a proof of Fermat's big theorem or Fermat's last theorem, but he said it wouldn't fit in the margins, okay? Um, it wouldn't fit in the margin. It every, Almost everybody thinks at this point that he had a proof that is kind of a famous false proof. Lots of people, uh, think that they have found a simple proof to Fermat's last theorem, and uh, and they all make like the same mistake, and it's sort of a famous mistake that everybody makes, and we and we think that perhaps Fermat was making that mistake, but uh, he he claims to have found a, a you know this this nice little theorem right here, namely if you give me a prime, then that and any integer at all, okay then that prime will divide that integer to that prime minus n. And which at first glance you're like, well, who cares? Why is that helpful? Um, and, and you'll see why it's, it's useful here pretty soon. Uh, and again, he claimed to have a proof of it, but no one ever found one. In fact, the first proof that was given was given by Leibniz, right? We know who Leibniz is, right? Yeah, and the co-discoverer of, of the calculus, uh, 1683. Okay, 43 years later. Now, uh, let me say, okay, n could be any integer. It could even be zero. Of course, if it's zero, it's sort of a stupid situation. You're saying p divides zero. Well, of course, p divides zero, yes? 
because p times zero is equal to zero, okay? Uh, and it's actually enough to show that this is true for any positive integer because, um, because it's obvious for p equal to two, okay? Look at that down there. Isn't it obvious? Like if you take p equal to two, it, do you guys see that this is just saying that two divides any integer squared minus that same integer? But that's just n times n minus one. And those are just consecutive integers, right? That I'm multiplying together. What has to be true about one of those two integers? It has to be even. Therefore, two will divide it, yeah? So Fermat's little theorem is sort of obvious for p equal to two. So we are gonna assume from this point on that p is odd. Does that make sense? So we'll say p is an odd prime because it's obvious for p equal to two. Okay. And so if I if I think about p equal to or if I if I think about p being an odd prime, then then I can actually reduce the problem to positive integers, because since since n is being raised to an odd power, I can actually factor out the minus sign. That's the essence of what's happening here, right? If I if I have a negative number and I raise it to an odd power, it's still going to be what negative. Yes, and I'm, if I subtract a negative number, that makes it positive. I can essentially factor out the minus sign and then reduce it down to just the positive situation. If you think about that for a second. So for instance, I mean, think about it. Uh, you know, suppose I take, suppose I take negative, oops, I have to put this in here. Suppose I take like negative, negative four, and I raise it to the three minus negative four, okay? Then, then don't you see, this is going to be like negative four cubed plus four, yes? And if I factor out a minus sign, what do I get? Minus four cubed minus four. And now don't you see, this is just basically four to the third minus four. The minus sign has been factored out and now it's just the positive version of it to the P minus the positive version of the number I started with, yes? So that's why we can kind of reduce the whole situation down to positive numbers. Once, I've, once I know it's true for P equal to two, uh, then I reduce it down to the case of just positive integers. And that's gonna be important because <laughs> we're gonna want uh, we're going to want positive integers because we're going to count something. And it wouldn't make any sense if these things were, were happen to be negative. Okay. That makes sense so far, hopefully. Okay. So obvious for p equal to two, we've reduced it to the case of p odd. If p is odd, then we can reduce to only positive integers. And of course, uh, zero is obvious as well. Does that make sense? Like the case of n equal to zero is also obvious. So for instance, uh, Fermat is saying that like three will divide 17 cubed minus 17, which, okay, right? Uh, three will also divide 17 trillion cubed minus 17 trillion. You understand what I'm saying here? Okay, so I mean, that's, that's pretty profound. Uh, and it's not obvious why that should be true at all. Here's how he does it, okay? So basically, remember, what are we gonna assume about P? What kind, of, what kind of a prime is it? P is what? Yeah, P is an odd prime, okay? And N is a positive integer, yeah? And it's going to be a positive integer, okay? And that, that allows us to be able to say, well, I'm gonna let P be the number of beads in a necklace I'm going to create, okay? P is going to be the number of beads in a necklace I'm going to create, okay? And N is going to be the number of colors. Now, do you see why I wanted this to be positive now? Yes? So it wouldn't make sense to have like negative four colors. Yeah. So N is going to be the number of colors for those beads, okay? So maybe N is three and my colors are red, green, and blue or something like that, right? Okay. Maybe N is 70, and then I have to start using things like mother of pearl and, you know, uh, other things, yeah? I mean, I might have 70 colors or something, but yeah. So here's what the proof in a sentence is. This is what we're going to do. 
we're going to construct all multicolored, so we get rid of the, the single color necklaces. By the way, how many single color necklaces are there? If I have N colors, so like suppose N was three, I had red, green, and blue as my colors. How many single color necklaces would there be? Three, a number of colors. There'd be an all red one, an all blue one, and an all green one. See what I mean? If I have N colors, how many single colored necklaces would I have? N. And that's gonna be the minus N part of this, okay? Like you're gonna get rid of the single colored necklaces to make sure that we're only dealing with things that have at least two colors in them, yeah? That's what the minus N is going to be. We construct all multicolored, that this is important, multicolored planar bracelets. What I mean by planar is like, we're not able to flip them over. They, they, they're stuck in the plane, like the, like the shapes in Flatland, yeah? Okay. The things are actually stuck in the plane, two-dimensional space. Uh, we, we construct all multicolored planar bracelets of P beads made from N available colors and show that there are exactly that many of them that are distinct rotationally. But if, if this is the number of something, then that has to be an integer. Does that make sense? <laughs> if I show that that is the number of distinct things and it's counting something, that has to be an integer. So what does that mean? What does that tell you about that number into the P minus N over P? It's an integer, which what does that mean about P's divisibility into N to the P minus N? It divides it evenly, yeah? So if I can show that that thing is the count of the number of uh, you know distinct multicolored bracelets, uh, we're done, okay? We'll, we will have shown that that quantity is an integer and, uh, and therefore that P divides the numerator. Why remove monochromatic bracelets? Uh, well, they look exactly the same when rotated, right? I mean, so if I have an all red necklace, they don't, they don't, they look exactly the same when I try to rotate them. Does that make sense? It's like I go red, 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 red. It's gonna look exactly the same. Whereas the other things look different as I rotate them, okay? Uh, what's a planar bracelet? Well, basically what I'm saying is those two things aren't the same. By the way, I tried to, one time I was showing this argument to a class and someone was like, I, I don't know what's going on. I can't tell the difference between colors. So I put little numbers in there, okay? Hopefully that kind of helps. I don't know if you find yourself in that situation, but planar bracelets means I can't flip them. I can't reflect them, okay? I can only rotate them, but I can't flip them over. So for instance, these two bracelets are not the same thing. Does that make sense? You can see, you see what I did to, to these? I basically flipped it over across that axis right there, yeah? But those are not the same thing. I'm not allowed to flip them. I can only rotate them. Make sense? Okay. So that's where we're going. To count bracelets, remember we're trying to count multicolored bracelets, the number of multicolored bracelets that are truly rotationally distinct. And to count bracelets, it's easier to start with left to right strings of beads and then to attach the ends later, yeah? So you start with a, a string of beads and that, that's how you would basically make a bracelet anyways. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, right? you put a piece of string out there, you put the beads on there and then you tie the end, yeah? Okay. But remember, we're stuck in the plane. Do you know what I'm? Do you know what I mean? Everything is kind of stuck in the plane. Okay. Attach the insulator. There are into the p minus n of these oriented strings that are not monochromatic. Where's the minus n coming from? What am I getting rid of? All the ones that have the same color. I have n colors. Yes. I have in colors. Why is it into the P? So suppose like, you know, suppose like N was four and P was three or, or, or so, hang on in this picture right here. I think I'm saying that P is like five or something like that, right? Okay. 
Suppose n was four and p was five, which is kind of the situation I find myself in here. How many options do I have for this first bead? How many color options do I have? Four options. How many options do I have for the second bead? Four, how many for the third? Four, how many for the fourth? Four, how many for the fifth? <laughs> Four, what do I do with all those fours? You multiply them together. Yeah? So you would have four to the fifth. Possible oriented string beads where I'm kind of reading these things left to right, yes? We'll worry about which, th which things uh, are truly different later on when we attach the ends. But then I would have to say, I don't want any monochromatic or single colored string beads, yeah? So what would I have to subtract from this? I have four possible colors and therefore four possible bracelets consisting of a single color, yes? So four to the fifth minus four would be the total number of these little string bead things, yeah? But not all of those are truly different. Not all of those are truly different. Don't you see, like what if I decided to put blue on the last, like what if I decided to put blue on all of the last like four things right here, but then I put orange right here, okay? Well, when I attach the end, that's gonna be equivalent to a lot of other strings where I had that orange bead somewhere else, yeah? Where I had like four blue beads and an orange bead somewhere else. Do you see what I mean? All of those weren't really different bracelets. They, can, they were constructed differently, but in the end, when I attached the ends, I ended up with the same stinking bracelet, yeah? Okay. So there are four to the fifth minus four of these oriented strings that are trapped in the plane when I'm kind of reading these things left to right, okay? Or into the P minus N of them to get, minus N to get rid of the single colored ones uh, in the general case, okay? So for instance, See this, this is the situation where I have, I guess here, what, what am I doing? Uh, so P is five, okay, five, remember P is the number of beads. And how many colors does it look like I'm using here? N is two, okay. And what I've done here is I've said, look, here's, here are some different ways I can kind of disperse these, you know, blue and yellow beads around, yes, or zero and one, whatever, however you wanna think about these colors. All of those are literally the same bracelet though once I attach the end, do you see that? So those were all counted as different when I went two to the fifth minus two. Those were all counted as different, but they weren't really different, yeah? But what do you notice? How many, how many of these are really the same? Five, how many of those are really the same? And, and it turns out we're going to be able to group them in that way and say, well, these five string beads really are, give rise to one bracelet. And in the end, what you're gonna do to figure out the number of truly distinct bracelets is you're gonna divide by five in this particular case. Or in the general case, you would divide by P, okay? So, like, so reading this, many of these oriented strings of beads will produce the same rotationally equivalent bracelet. But how many? Well, there will be exactly P Multicolored strings that give rise to the same bracelet. Why P? Well, I just shift the beads down like that. Like I just shift them along this line. And how many bead shifts are there? Right, there are P of them. Yes, in general, there are, five, there are basically five bead shifts. And we see that all of these are basically the same. They kind of, they all correspond to a different place of, of kind of attaching that bracelet, yes? Or vice versa, kind of cutting that bracelet and stretching it out, yeah? Okay. All right, I think that's kind of a cool picture. Now, here's the thing. If you might say, well, what, what, if, what if P wasn't a prime? Well, then you can start falling into a trap of having multiple groups that kind of ro rotate into each other like this example right here. 
Do you see that this top group and the bottom group are exactly the same? It doesn't fall into just one group anymore. And, uh, and that's because six is divisible by something other than just itself and one, yeah? So this is where the primality is, uh, is very important. So P equal to six doesn't work. And that's because six is not prime, okay? But if there is a prime number of beads, you're guaranteed to not return to the original thing until you've shifted through all P of the beads. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. And here's a little picture of the P equal to five and equal to two situation. This is all, uh, let's, okay, what, what is two to the fifth minus two? What's that? That's 30, okay? So this is all 30 of the, right, right what, where, what are the monochromatic bracelets? It would be the one that's all yellow or the one that's all blue in this case. We've gotten rid of those. So there are 30, right? Six plus six plus six plus six, right? Six, or hang on, five, five plus five plus five. There are six groups of five bracelets here, yes? Or string beads. But every single one of these groupings gives the same bracelet. You see what I'm saying? So to get the true number of multicolored bracelets, I would have to take this number and do what? Divide by five. Yeah? And in general, to get the true number, you have to go into the P minus N over P, okay? Because you would have these little groups of size P that really are not different once you attach the ends, okay? I think that's kind of cool. You see that? You see how those groups work, right? All of those give rise to the bracelet that's kind of above it, okay? That's cool. So here's what Fermat's little theorem is saying. Okay, so that, that's like literally the end of the proof, okay? The conclusion is that there are N to the P minus N over P multicolored bracelets. That's it. That's why I wrote QED right there. Okay, that's literally the end of the proof. You can kind of think about, you know, uh, shifting those beads around and why the primality of P was necessary. I kind of gave you an example of why it was, but that's it. It's just this picture right here, which I think is just amazing. Okay. So here's a couple of things that Fermat's little theorem is equivalent to. So Fermat's little theorem says that P divides any integer to the P minus N, yeah? That's actually equivalent to, uh, well, it's equivalent to n to the p minus n mod p equaling what? Equaling zero, yeah? Which, by the way, is the same thing as n to the p mod p equaling n mod p, okay? Right, we've kind of seen those, those uh, we've seen this before. Okay, so into the P minus N, or into the P minus P is equal to N mod P. So that's what Fermat's little theorem is equivalent to. Uh, and that's because we've talked about this before, X mod M equaling Y mod M means that X minus Y mod M is zero, which in turn means that M divides X minus Y. Yeah, we've kind of seen the equivalence of all these things. Right, so P dividing into the P minus N implies that into the P minus N mod P is zero, which implies that into the P mod P is equal to N mod P. So into the P, basically what this is saying is that into the P has the same remainder upon division by P as N does mod P, and okay, where P is a prime. So all of those statements are the same. And it turns out this fact is going to be the critical puzzle piece to solving RSA cryptography. The Fermat's little theorem will be, in addition to some other things, but this is really the key, all right? So for instance, I mean, you know, 35 to the, uh, 35 to the 37 mod 37, Okay, so 35 to 37, that's a massive number. Do you understand? In fact, let's throw, let's throw one on here, okay? In fact, let's throw another one on here. I don't care, okay? That number raised to the 37, which is massive, 
fact, let's put a seven on front of there, okay? So 71,135 raised to the 37 mod 37. That means you want the remainder of that upon division by 37, yes? That is going to be the same as 71,135. Forget about the power, mod 37. Okay. So let's 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 check that out. Seven one one three five. Okay, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna leave this in here. Let's actually go. Let's actually go and look at Wolfram Alpha. Okay, I left that in there on purpose just so I can remember these numbers. So watch seven one one three five raised to the thirty seven. I always get nervous about doing that, and then I'm gonna go mod. 37, okay, what does it end up being? Is this gonna kill the system? No, it did it, right? It says it's 21. The remainder of that upon division by 37 is 21. You knew the remainder had to be something between zero and 36, correct? Okay, well, and now we just say, well, what if I just did 71, 135? Hey, so did that in a hurry, it's 21. Right? They have the same remainder upon division by 37. Which is, which is pretty cool. So I don't know. Okay, that number mod 37 is 17, yes? Yeah? That, that giant abomination. In fact, let's put another number in there. Okay, like that. But if I, so 20, 20 is the remainder of this abomination. Let's put a couple more numbers in. So like eight, okay? Now, if I raise that to the 37, what should I get? Hopefully, it's not just spitting it out automatically this time, but yeah, you get eight. Make sense? Okay. So for Ma's little theorem is pretty, pretty impressive. We're going to use it to solve RSA cryptography on Monday. That's it.